Okay, thank you guys for coming. Let's uh, let's start off uh, here. I'm going to let the uh, the slides that we have go through. Um, uh, Jack certainly was a, a unicorn of sorts. He uh, dodged the camera and it was hard to capture sometimes. So thank you for folks for uh, sending in uh, some of these that really capture, I think, his essence. And uh, tonight uh, is a little bittersweet, I think, uh, certainly for me and, and, and likely for all of us uh, coming either across campus or across the country. Um, there's a lot of memories here at Michigan State, and uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, Jack, uh, was, uh, was woven through all of them. Um, just a couple opening comments myself. Uh, first, if, if you parked outside and you got a ticket, uh, you can get a voucher to get back out. So just make sure that that heads out that way. Talk to uh, Beth, and she'll make sure that you have that. It's also up at the front. Um, the second thing is I just really appreciate and want to um, respect and honor Jack's family. Uh, who, like Jack, has lots of um, uh, varied, wide-ranging interests all over the world, and that's where they live, and that's why it was difficult th for them to come here. But they uh, very much appreciate and um, uh, um, uh, want us to know how much it means to them that uh, we're here and celebrating uh, him. They maybe didn't always know exactly what he was up to, but they uh, loved him and respected him. And um, maybe that's kind of how we feel sometimes. But anyway, I think it's important to uh, point that out. Um, in particular, uh, Jack uh, took, um, when he was on a uh, scholarship uh, collecting specimens in Australia, he uh, took along uh, his 13-year-old nephew. And that made all the difference uh, in that young man's life, uh, and that was in 1970, I think. And so uh, I, it, I don't think I had heard that, or not often much, but that was the kind of person that, that Jack was, um, even back then, just uh, come along, I'm going, you're welcome to come with me. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to uh, say here recently, um, I, wa I wasn't uh, here, but I was corresponding and thinking about Jack quite often and uh, meeting up with him and talking with him, and I know that he was crazy busy. I've been gone for 10 years. Oh, I've got to go help the medical school get rolling in Grand Rapids. He wouldn't use that language, but the idea was that um, he was a tireless supporter of all things Michigan State. And uh, that would not have happened had he not had some help as his health deteriorated. And so um, I think it's very important uh, to, to recognize that uh, his, his, his friends, his, his care staff, and, and in many ways his family uh, are, are here tonight. And I'd like us all to um, acknowledge them. Uh, we've got Phil and Gary and Rob um, that... <clears throat> that uh, were, were patient and supportive and also shared a sense of humor, obviously, to uh, be able to accommodate uh, such a, a Catholic and eclectic person. And so thank you guys. It, it, it made all the difference in the world. In particular, this summer, um, I don't know how you did it, but uh, made it out uh, to Seattle, uh, where I live, by way of Salt Lake City, where Jack caught up with his aunt. Driving around at 96 or 97, um, and comes from a hearty stock, obviously. And uh, so that was a, a real kick. And then he made it over to, uh, you guys were helping him drive over the mountains. And his health was such that that was quite difficult. Um, but that never really got in his way. It just was something else for him to address, segregate, and overcome. And so uh, the guys drove over the Cascades and made it to Moscow. And he would make a dramatic pause, uh, because that's where his meeting was, Idaho. And where uh, he was tickled that uh, Kay Holcamp was going to be our um, uh, colleague here as well, was given the keynote address. And so in this last uh, long trip, uh, he got to see her before then driving up to Vancouver. Correct me if I'm wrong here. It's quite a, a, a trip. Um, and he, uh, for the human brain mapping meeting, and that's where I joined you guys and, and rode down with him. Uh, for a last ride. Um, thank goodness he wasn't driving, uh, as I've been reminded uh, tonight uh, when I was here. And this is him going home, obviously looking uh, relieved, uh, serene, and uh, looking forward to getting back to Michigan, I'm pretty sure. Um, and now we're beginning. Uh, you can see the, the joy and the serenity there uh, connecting many de decades. Um, but the only other things that I want to say now are we're really here to think about Jack himself. We all 
realize, I, I've realized that, that he's entwined in our, our professional and personal lives and in a way that um, he, he didn't insinuate himself there. It just sort of kind of came together and he was a very uh, gentle and gracious person. And uh, the one absolutely unanimous thing that uh, people from all over have reported is that he treated everybody equal. I mean, this was a, a truly kind man who uh, would encourage you uh, and support you, um, and, but maybe take you down a notch when you needed it. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I let, wanted you to flourish, wanted uh, uh, all of us to, to thrive and to grow and to blossom in a sense. And I think um, he thought the best way to do that uh, was through discovery and curiosity and, and the wonders of uh, just the surprise of life. And uh, I'm so glad I got to see him this summer because that was very much intact. And I'm so glad that my little boys got to hug him. They weren't scared of him. In fact, they thought he was as good as Santa Claus. Have you been to outer space? You know, you know about the brain? Um, and, and hugged him, and, and that was really a life force for him. And uh, I know that uh, Phil Jr. here uh, was uh, very much exposed to that directly, and I'm a little bit jealous that, that but at the same time, I think that uh, that was good for Jack as well. In any case, I'll quit yammering. The well, most important thing is to talk about Jack um, and, and how uh, about him. And tonight we've got a, a short list of folks, I think, that want to uh, offer some remembrances and some connections, um, starting with uh, Dr. Rubel, Ed Rubel, uh, coming in from the UW. Uh, this was Jack's first graduate student. Um, Roger Reap, a uh, constant colleague, uh, someone who uh, I've known 20 years, I think, along with uh, Dr. Switzer, Bob, uh, who's here, and um, part of the extended family of Jack's. And I hope that people, that's the one thing that I'll feel about, uh, even when I wasn't in his lab, uh, even across campus, even across states and countries, this was all something connected to him, and, and that's uh, his contribution, I think, in the biggest sense is to education and enriching people's lives. And I think that um, Dr. Recting here at, uh, will have some comments at the end about specific interesting transitional states here at Michigan uh, State, and then we will uh, try to wrap up um, around 7, and all are welcome to join us. We've got reservations at Dusty Cellar, um, just up Hagedorn and East. Uh, where join us for cocktails or sit down for a dinner where I hope that we can continue to, to catch up and, and socialize. So thank you and uh, glad for being here. I'm going to turn this off for now because I think um, it might have something. Thanks. Oh, and sorry, uh, speakers, uh, we're aiming for seven minutes, eight minutes, something like that. So uh, um, I don't give hairy eyeballs, but I might clear my throat. Just kidding. <laughs> Thanks. It's great to see everybody here uh, honoring Jack. And I want to thank all of you for coming. I'm Ed Rubel. Uh, most people know me as my, Jack's first graduate student. Actually, I wasn't. OK, it's a lie. There's a guy, Jack always uh, reminded me that uh, a guy named Ray Winters was uh, formerly his first graduate student. Uh, Ray never worked in the lab much, OK? And he really worked on vision with uh, a professor. but. But he graduated, somehow Jack became his mentor, or his uh, official advisor, and he graduated a month before I did, so I wasn't his first graduate student, although I think Jack thinks I was. Uh, I, I, I had to ask my wife, uh, what were your early remembrances of Jack? Because I was having a hard time dealing with this, okay, and and what to say and what not to say, <laughs> and uh, and she said, you know, Jack was very quiet, and in those days, Jack was very very quiet. Oh, I should say, I got to know Jack when he first came to Michigan State University. He was very quiet, and she said, but I could always tell by looking at his eyes what he was thinking. He, his eyes would either sparkle, or he'd look down, or he'd look over to the side like, you're crazy, or <laughs> and, uh, and And she said, yeah, there was that. And then we spent a lot of time at his house early on. And I got to tell you, Ed, any time a guy covers his entire house with maps, don't ask him where something, or don't challenge him about where something is. <laughs> 
Jack loved maps. I mean, it didn't matter what kind of map. It could be a map of the brain. It could be a map of something else. You could sit down and say, you know, where's Podunk uh, Falls, Idaho? And he'd say, well, it's right near this, and it's on this street, and it's on that. Every class, he knew everyone. OK, um, I'm going to make the classic mistake uh, that I tell everybody never to do when you're talking about a memorial uh, in a memorial service of talking a little bit about myself. And this, I'm going to do that just by uh, giving a reflection of how I met Jack, because that's really about Jack. Okay, I was a, a second year graduate student in psychology, but I had preceded Jack in terms of Michigan State University uh, by a lot, uh, by a number of years, because I got my undergraduate degree here, and I was working on my master's degree doing imprinting studies with Stan Ratner. Uh, well, Stan was across campus. I was doing imprinting studies. Uh, and so Jack came, and he was teaching a class called Techniques in Physiological Psychology with Glenn Hatton, who I already knew. And it was Jack's first year, I believe, and he was just setting up a lab. But we never went to the lab that he was setting up. We did it in the Psychology Research Building, which was new there then. And uh, so the class got over. I had to, I had to stop going to school that summer because my wife uh, had gone back to school, and we needed money. Uh, and so I had lined up a job with a guy named Rokic doing statistics for him during the summer full time. And that was great. I was all set to do that. And uh, one day I went to the mailbox in psychology and I pulled out my science magazine and it kind of opened up because there was a, a straight pin in it. And I stuck that pin in my hand when I'm opening it up and I was mad already. And, uh, and it, there was a note inside about this big uh, that said, in sort of nice writing. Would you like to work for me this summer, full-time, part-time, or any time? That was Jack's way of quietly communicating to me that if I wanted a job, I could have a job. And I jumped at it. And I went over to the lab, and I started working. And I told the story last night. He walked in. He, Jack never got there before 11 o'clock for all the uh, no. And, then, and at that time, it was time for lunch. OK, so he walked in, and he gave me a bucket. And there was a sheep head in the bucket. And he gave me the bucket. He gave me a, a big Maxwell House coffee can that was empty. And he gave me a hammer and a chisel. And he handed this to me. And he said, take the brain out. And he left for lunch. <laughs> so that's, that's all I'll talk about myself, OK? Um, anyway, Jack had a really interesting approach to science. And it was an approach that many of us loved. It was an approach that said, if it's interesting, do it. You don't have to figure out how important it is. We don't know what's going to be important 20 years, 30 years, 50 years from now. So if it's good science and you're going to do it well, just do it. Uh, and also, trust your own senses. I remember one day I was looking at an atlas. He was, he was showing, projecting pictures of a cat brain that I had sectioned down onto the table, and I was looking at an atlas to find out what I was looking at. And Jack walked in the room, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm looking at the atlas to see what the boundaries of these nuclei are. He said, you look at the tissue to figure out what the boundaries are. And he said, it was all about trust your own senses, Think about what you want to do and go do it. Uh, he just wanted to, us to solve problems and learn to solve problems and learn to trust ourselves. And he did some you know, kind of strange things. Uh, where, can I, where can I advance the slides? Uh, this? Ah, we need a keyboard. OK. OK. He just wanted us to, to look at tissue, look at our animals, and make up our own decisions. And he, he wanted us to just, uh-oh, that's me. OK. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> uh, he just wanted us to make our own decisions about what he was doing. And he would do anything he needed to do. OK, so uh, you know, one week, appeared out at the farm, Jack's wallabies. 
Bennett's wallabies. These are about this tall, okay? And we had built a fence out at the farm, and he imported a whole colony of wallabies, okay? Uh, they, the fence was about 10 feet high, so they couldn't jump over it, and he decided we were going to... I have no idea where the money came from. I have no idea how he did it. I don't know how he arranged it, but there was a col colony of wallabies to do brain mapping on, okay? My job was mainly to... Uh, uh, catch the wallabies, okay, and put them in a, a gunny sack and, and take them back to the lab. Jack did not like sports at all, okay. <laughs> uh, he allowed me to do a dissertation that had nothing to do with what his interests were, except that it was mapping, but it was on development, and to this day, I mean, I had a fellowship to pay my stipend, but to this day, I don't know who paid for the cats. Okay, we eventually built a building, a, a colony, a breeding colony. Uh, I don't know who paid for the equipment. I don't know who paid for some of the histological help. I got my wife to do some of it, but not most of it. Uh, she quit doing that real fast. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but he gave me a whole, another room in the lab that got called Rubel's Romper Room, just to do experiments I wanted to do. Okay, again, not knowing who paid for it. But, but there were a number of quirky things that Jack did besides the wallabies that I didn't know. Uh, yeah, we don't want that yet. Uh, Jack was quirky, okay? He parked cars by feel. Mostly he <laughs> drove by feel. Okay, uh, he, he had this old green Chevy station wagon, okay, that was, looked like it was corrugated on the sides because he would drive into parking lots and he'd turn into a pole and he hit that pole with the side of the car and then he'd back out and hit another pole and finally he got the car parked. And so the whole thing looked like a corrugated car. Uh, when that one was too corrugated and fell apart, was falling apart, okay, we at that time were mapping the sheep brain and we had to go out to the farm and get the sheep and anesthetize it and take it in. He gave me the car. Well, he charged me $25 and he paid the, the insurance as long as we could transport the sheep back and forth. Uh, in my car, okay, and he gave me the car. He got another car, and within a few months, it started looking corrugated, okay. <laughs> that was another one of the uh, things, okay. Uh, he did another cor funny thing. I mean, all of us have stories. About an hour before my, th two hours before my thesis defense, Jack decided we shouldn't have it in a room like this or a regular classroom. We should have it under the cork tree in the old horticulture gardens which if you remember were right near the outdoor swimming pool. And he decided that we should have it there and I should carry out a, an easel and a big pad of paper like that and uh, draw things. I'm a terrible artist uh, on there. And the, fa and the fact that set up chairs and the faculty, my committee would be there uh, and they'd all be looking out at the pool and it was in the springtime and of course all the co-eds were walking. Of course the committee was all males. Okay, in those days. So Jack said, I almost flunked my thesis defense because nobody was listening and I was so different. But, but I, I, uh, I did pass, fortunately. I'm not sure why. Mostly about Jack is Jack cared. He really cared about us. And he cared about us in every way possible, okay? Here's a picture taken uh, after I went on the faculty at Yale uh, with my daughter and my son underneath and Jack. And this just, he was an incredibly caring person. Uh, the, you know, it was a sort of, he gave us little snippets of his caring uh, about us in general. The, the, the words for this event uh, that John and I think Bob picked out uh, read, uh, you never have time, you either make time or you take time. I actually heard these long ago. We were walking to lunch. I, often I went to lunch with Glenn Hatton and, and Jack Johnson. Um, most days I did. And my, my wife would say we went to dinner every day with Jack. And then I went back to the lab. But we did probably go to dinner uh, two or three times a week. But anyway, we were walking to lunch and uh, Jack... Uh, and I was complaining about how I hadn't gotten anything done. I think it was my second half, second to last year in graduate school. And I, I said, and then Jack said, well, what did you get done? And I said a few things. And he said, you know, 
you'll never get it all done. You'll never have time, okay? And what that means about your life is you have to play, plan your fun as carefully or more carefully than you plan your work, okay? Now, that was Jack. I mean, the work was in his lab, but he was giving me advice about life, okay? So to Jack, it was all about us. And it was about the whole of us, not just the work we did in the lab. Uh, and I'll end with this picture, because we all take that, that caring about ourselves, our students, that it's about them. It's about our students. It's about our friends. It's about our family. This shows you four generations of Jack's family. Myself, Dan Sains, who was a postdoc in my lab, and Melissa Caress, who's uh, now a postdoc in Dan's lab, but was a student of mine. And each one of them, we've tried to pass on those kinds of ideas, uh, how to fit science into our lives and how to do the science that we really care about. So thank you again for all of you coming, and it's wonderful to be able to talk about Jack with you. Well, it's so nice to see everybody here. My name is Roger Reap, and uh, I couldn't agree more with the things that John Morris said and the things that Ed Rubel just said. Um, I feel honored to be able to stand here and tell you about my reminiscences of Jack. Um, perfect lead-in, Ed. This is a picture from about 1975, and this is a group of us. It's not everybody that took his, his famous course in vertebrate neural systems, which went on for a whole year, uh, but this is uh, several of us. And uh, for those of you that know the famous photograph of Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was an early Spanish neuroscientist, he took his own picture by, by standing, by hitting a bulb with his foot, you know, to activate the camera. And Bill Armstrong there in his right hand, he's doing the same thing. So we, we got a big laugh out of that. But, but uh, exactly what Ed was saying, I worked in a lab across the hall from Jack's. I wasn't one of Jack's grad students, but I was a grad student with Kathy Lovell, who's here in the lab across the hall. And I got to know everybody by, by taking this course, you know. So, but I was amazed because Jack would leave, you know, 5 o'clock or whatever, whenever he left. And we, we would be like monkeys in the lab the rest of the night, you know, doing experiments. And he gave us free run of the lab. And, uh, you know, this was phenomenal to me. Um, one of the things that I found out later in the time that I grew to collaborate with Jack, uh, he came to me one time. I think I graduated from uh, my PhD in 1979, somewhat, some, somewhere around there. And about three years later, I was at the neuroscience meetings in... Um, Minneapolis, and Jack comes up and he says, uh, you know, Ted says we should study manatee brains, because I'm, I'm from Florida. I was back in Florida at that point, and that's where manatees are found. And I said, wow, that sounds interesting. And so he tells me a little more about it, and like Ed said, he, he sort of lit this little candle that I'm still doing. I'm still doing that, you know? Well, what is that, 30, 35 years later, something like that. And Jack... I gave you the feeling that, uh, you know, he would, he would give you the feeling that you had this world to discover. And it was definitely on you. He wasn't going to give you directions. He wasn't going to give you a map. He was going to give you opportunity. And he was going to give you kind, caring encouragement but not really specific encouragement, more like freedom encouragement, you know, like, like this is yours to mess up or make something of, you know, you're on your own, but if you, if you got the drive and you got the individual, whatever it is that you want to go forward, you know, here's where you can do it, in my lab. And uh, many of us in that course, being in his lab for a year, sort of as honorary members, uh, took that to heart. And I want to say uh, exactly uh, to Ed's point, too, that these were lessons about life. These were lessons to me about how you treat other people. 
And I can tell you that I treated the people in my own lab over the last 35 years in the ways that I learned from Jack of giving them freedom and, and having them believe that, that if they wanted to make discoveries, this was how you do it. And one of the things that several of us talked about in the last couple of days is that uh, he gave you the freedom to make mistakes and to realize that's the natural process of discovery when you're doing science particularly. And experimental, messy, hands-on mistakes. And sometimes we broke stuff and then we'd have to fix it. And uh, that was part of it, too. Um, so the kindness, the compassion, the sense of discovery, the sense that we were complete people. I feel like Jack saw all of me, he, like Ed was just saying. He saw you as a whole person. You weren't just like an employee in the lab or anything. And it wasn't a temporary thing. You knew that you would be friends with Jack your whole life if you stayed in science and had con convergent interests of some kind. And that was true. Um, I want to end with a uh, wonderful email Jack sent me. And this goes to Ed's point about how Jack would reveal things about himself, particularly as the years went on, I, in my experience, that I really uh, felt um, he showed more of himself all the time. And as you know, uh, he, was, he was interested in music and played the piano and the clarinet in the Notre Dame marching band, played the piano, loved Beethoven. So I'll give you a minute to read what he wrote me back in uh, February when I had uh, notified him that one of the things I was doing was learning a Beethoven sonata to play on the piano. And this was his reply. What I find interesting about it several things interesting about it. One is the use of the word ecstatic. That's not something you hear in the world of science that often. And it wasn't even something I heard from Jack that often, that kind of sentiment. But I think uh, it really, he was opening up that dimension of himself more and more as, as time went on. Um, and of course, the little anecdote about the cat. I mean, that's pure Jack, you know? So sort of put this little mystery out there like, here's this phenomenon, you know, that nobody can understand, and yet it happens. And he, he, he embraced that kind of thing, you know, the serendipity of life. This was a, a really good example of that. So uh, I have had, uh, like many of you, this week I've, uh, you know, come back to the campus for the first time in many years, and a lot of uh, ups and downs in my feeling, a lot of heavy heart. Uh, from time to time. And then I walk around and see some nice foliage, and I know Jack would appreciate this and that, and, you know, spirits lift, and then they go back down again. So it's been a very uh, powerful time to revisit the, the feelings of being here in those days and being here now without Jack. As I told John a few weeks ago, uh, the thing I know about all of us that interacted with Jack is that there's a piece of him in all of us because of how he touched us. And uh, I, that, I hope that doesn't sound too trite, but it's very real to me. Um, and so I feel like, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that forward, you know, that, that knowledge that the community we have here, there's a piece of him in all of us. And I know that the, the honesty, his, his, his bedrock honesty, his compassion, his forthrightness, and his toughness those are all qualities that coexist, and there's not many people I can say that about. So thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, Good evening, my name is, <clears throat> is Archie Fobbs. I'm the collections manager for the uh, Department of Health Affairs at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I've been asked to uh, read two, two uh, statements from two very distinguished people who couldn't be here today. Uh, one is uh, from Carol, who is Wally Welker's wife. Uh, Carol was very uh, emotional about not being here today because 
of her uh, having a family obligation with her mother that uh, demanded her time and, and her attention. So um, she was very heartbroken about not being here, but asked me if I would uh, convey her feelings and uh, read her statement. So I'm honored to have that opportunity. And she writes, on behalf of my husband, Wally, and myself, I wanted to convey extreme gratitude to Jack for all he means to us throughout our lives. Words cannot fully express the true friendship and love Jack and Wally shared with one another in both their personal and professional lives. I'll be forever grateful. I was able not only to observe the special bond, but to take part in it. My first impression of Jack will remain true throughout our friendship. He was gentle, compassionate, and generous soul, an intellect in science, politics, and life. He was witty, savvy, and loved to laugh. New to the Department of Neurophysiology as their illustrator in the fall of 1976, I knew only of Jack through stories of his collaboration with Wally. His first, we first met during what would become his routine visit to Wisconsin. He and Richard would drive their van from Okimo, Michigan to Madison once or twice a year, where Jack and Wally would perform experimental research together, spend days under the microscope viewing brain sections, and consult on new findings for joint publications or edit grant proposals. I was lucky enough to accompany Wally to numerous neuroscience conferences where Jack joined us daily in lively conversation. Jack's history at the University of Wisconsin began in the 1960s. As a special research fellow, the assemblage of the initial brain collection at Wisconsin began with Wally with impetus from Clinton Woolsey. Jack soon became Wally's main collaborator for the early collecting activities. He continued these comparative studies at Michigan State University, where he expanded his comparative brain collection and studies on a wide variety of marsupials. Roger Reap's contribution of Florida manatee brains were later added to the impressive University of Wisconsin brain collection. As the years passed, it became apparent to both Jack and Wally that these invaluable resources must be made available for students, researchers, and teachers through the internet, and that they be located at one central site for perpetual preservation and use. Jack was the principal investigator for the funded 1991 through 1994 National Science Foundation grant entitled Imaging the Diversity of Mammalian Brains, an Electronic Catalog for Wide Accessibility. Soon after being awarded this grant, I began to scan brain sections for the atlas to be placed on our newly created comparative mammalian website. Following that came 1995 to 1997 National Science Foundation collaborative research assessing brain collection information via internet, CD-ROM, and centralized location. This grant, co-authored by Jack and Wally, along with Adrian No and Archie Fobbs of the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., where the University of Wisconsin and Michigan State University collections were transferred. Here, they were, would be housed, curated, cataloged, and available for viewing and study for decades to come. Archie, Jack and Wally's chief advocate for archiving these scientific treasures, carefully orchestrated the detailed transfer of these neuroanatomical collections. All three devoted timeless hours conversing via phone and email and then through subsequent travels to make the procurement of these collections come to fruition. As Wally's travels became limited and health issues prevented him from being physically active in the lab and at home, he and Jack spent, would spend hours on the phone 
and enthusiastic conversation late into the night. Observing these interactions remain priceless to me. From their first days together in the 60s through 2007, these two scientists will remain true comrades in work and in play. After Wiley's passing in 2007, Jack and I jointly began the task of responding to the numerous inquiries we received daily on the University of Wisconsin Comparative Mammalian Collections website. As I began to think of retirement, Jack took it upon himself to search for a new permanent home for the University of Wisconsin website, where upkeep and management would be maintained. Graciously, Bob Switzer came forth to offer his facilities and staff to at Neuroscience Associates to take on this incredible role. It was ever more heartening when Jack approached me in 2008, initiating talk of a conference in Wiley's honor. Along with the assistance of other esteemed colleagues, Jack's leadership in organizing the prestigious conference and tribute as a, was astounding. He spent a sabbatical year and more planning the symposium. New studies of neurobehavioral neuro evolution in June of 2010, which was attended by family, friends, and renowned colleagues from around the world, I remain eternally grateful to him for this wondrous event. I know Jack would be humbled by this memorial. Paying our respects to him as a scientist, as a teacher, he would be most proud. My relationship to Jack as a dear friend goes well beyond that. I know in my heart, somewhere at this very moment, Jack and Wiley are most likely engaged in an exciting debate on the functional significance of fissures and gyri, <laughs> or perhaps somatosensory nuclei found in the thalamus. One can only hope. And that's from Carol. One other statement that I'd like to read is from our director, Dr. Adrian Noy from the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Thank you for this humbling opportunity to join Archie Fobbs in sharing a few moments about the privilege of working with Jack Johnson at the National Museum of Health and Medicine for over 25 years. There were years marked with his innate joy of learning and of teaching with curiosity and generosity, and with an extraordinary chance to interact with the neuroscience family tree that has no equal in the world. His friendship and scholarly work with Wiley Welker led to his thoughtful guidance of Wiley's memorial at the museum that became a picture of his own, in Jack's particular thoughtful guidance of Wiley's memorial at the museum that became a picture of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the same thing, extensive academic legacy. And Jack's influence on the national collections, its long story, which is merely punctuated by this memorial event. As his impact continues with all students who use the collection, with each researcher inspired by his challenging questions, and with every collections manager who learns how to care for these extraordinary holdings so other generations can learn from them and frame their own important inquiries. We will do our best to make sure each of these individuals learn about the extraordinary man who assembled the collection they travel so far to use. All of us at the museum are grateful for over a quarter of a century of his unique friendship, mentorship, scholarship, and generosity and humor. Thank you very much, Adrian Noe. Um, just wanted to add a few of my own words. Um, I had the distinct pleasure of working hand in hand with Jack uh, to bring the collections, to preserve the collections to the museum, along with Wiley. And so over the, uh, when, this, when I got the call from John, it was kind of, when I saw the 517 
area code, I let it ring a couple of times before I answered it. And uh, kind of knew what it was about. And uh, I could tell from his voice what he was about to tell me. So it was a pleasure and an honor to be here. I wish it was for a different occasion. But over the time, I was thinking, what words would I use to kind of describe it? And over our days of conversation, there's some words that came to mind. Uh, friendship, mentorship, scholarship, and generosity and humor. That's in all of our conversations that we remember. Those are words that were constantly repeated over and over again. And so when we think about those words, they equal one thing, power. And what do you do with that power? Well, one of the greatest characteristics that Jack Johnson displayed was that he had a lot of power. And he knew how to use it and when to use it. And he imparted that power on each and every one of us. Big shoes to fill as we move forward. But we will have him to be looking over us. And at the end of the day, we'll need him to say, job well done because we have been taught by the master himself. Thank you very much. Thanks, R.G. I was already thinking I was going to have a hard time finding my voice, but uh, <laughs> you let it off with um, so much heartfelt feelings. So what to say, what to say about this man? Um, my beginning was I was in the biophysics department. Uh, started there in 1966, first as a, just a worker in the lab and later would actually join uh, the graduate department. And I was working for Barnett Rosenberg and he was uh, a physics guy, had gone into biophysics and was interested in the transduction mechanism of not only retina, vision, but also of the olfactory system as a sideline. And so I was working in the lab testing some things, doing quite physics type of things, semiconductivity of carotene type molecules, and was just fascinated. And pretty soon you begin to wonder, say, okay, well, here's all this. This is pretty neat what's happening. What's the wiring diagram behind this? That's the arrogant notion of a physics guy. So I said, there was this stuff going on downstairs in Jack Johnson's lab, and so I went down there, figured, okay, we'll figure out this wiring diagram, and we'll, we'll have an answer. <laughs> we still don't. <laughs> but when I saw the wiring diagram, such as we knew it at the time, with the sections that were coming off from his marsupial collection, I mean, these were like cookies coming out of the oven every day, these new sections of a new species. It was, it was a Camelot of the time. It was so, so exciting. And, and I was there. And I got hooked. I got hooked. And um, after a period with a McNamara Fellowship in the Army, I uh, came back and uh, entered graduate school and had my wife, Julie, in tow. That was one of the great things about having been drafted. <laughs> and so I, I, so I began. And it is. It was, a, it was a wondrous time. I think about all the things that, that Jack did. He really didn't know what was happening at the time. But in retrospect, you look back, I look back, I and mean, you've heard the other guys, it's the same thing. I think it's the same for everybody that was in Jack's presence and spent time with him. And that was he set such a nurturing environment. Julie came up with an expression last night. She says, it was graduate school in a Montessori concept. And I said, yeah, that's right. I said, that's perfect. And, and indeed it was. As I said, you, you really didn't know it. He gave us the liberty of exploring things on our own. He didn't stand in the way. He had the subtle guidance. I remember one of the other graduate students ahead of me, John Hayton, and, um, and Lee Weller, I was concerned about you know, seeing or sensing approval 
by Jack for what the things I was doing. I said, it, it, he, he hasn't said anything. He says, well, that's the key. If you weren't doing well, he would say something. So, so <laughs> nothing said is, is the best. He, um, he provided all of us a launching pad to do what we did later. And in the style, and the guys have already said this, in the style that he did, we've tried to emulate to those that have been our charge and are embarking at the same time, time that we were. I tried to make some, some notes about things that I'd like to say. There's so many. Um, try to make the notes so I can maybe not forget them. <laughs> but, and I really lost track of where I was. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I'll just um, throw back my head, close my eyes, and go. <laughs> and it'll all come to me. That's right. So some of the words uh, that come to mind when you think about Jack as, as a person and then what he meant to a lot of us, uh, Archie already said a number of them, um, you know, generous, thoughtful, caring, sharing, clever, passionate, and you can see from what Ed said, sly, scheming. <laughs> he was so eclectic. I mean, it's, it's sort of trivial to say, oh, if you want to look up eclectic in the dictionary, you'll see a picture of Jack. Well, this is a guy you would not want to play trivial pursuit with. <laughs> No way. I mean, he was so informed. I marveled all the time. Years later, bring up something and not expecting to hear anything from it. And he gives you line and verse, not just of the facts, but of the, the feeling and the, the, the sense of the time, like he had been there. We talked about maps. I forget how it happened, but we were talking about the borders of states. He was fascinated with how the borders of states came to be. And he says, I've got to do a book on that someday. Sometime later, he sends me a copy of this book. Someone already did it. <laughs> and it was, really, it was really fun. I remember one we talked about, I think what started the conversation was the, up, the northern boundary of Delaware. You can see how geeky this gets. This is, this is Jack. The northern boundary, it looks like someone struck a circle. You know, there was a center point. And digging into it the way you would with any curiosity that Jack nurtured, I found out that it wasn't that simple, that there were more to it, and I won't go into it, but it was fun. And that's what he surely made discovery was, the exploration of it, so much fun. And here's something else we learned from Jack. Don't be worried about a pause in time where there's silence. That's okay. <laughs> so I'll be Jack-esque. I think I've pretty much covered it all. You could go and say many of the same kinds of things again and again. But this guy, he was a sculpture of us. The phrase that John has at the beginning of the program you know, it triggered thinking along those lines. And the sculpturing hasn't stopped. It continues. It's going to continue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, just one last thing. Yeah, I was talking to Keith before, and um, Jack permeates us. All his influence permeates us then, since, and in the future. And what a wonderful gift. When I was on the verge of breaking from academia and going into business to start my own business, it didn't happen all at once. It was some incubation time. Jack and I used to room together at the neuroscience meeting for a number of years, up until the business started exhibiting at SFN. <laughs> and I didn't have the time. It's too bad. 
But I mentioned to him one time, I said, you know, I think I'm going to start a business. And I said a little bit about it. And he didn't say anything. And then the next time we got together, we're unpacking our things. It was in New Orleans. I remember it well. He says, so um, tell me a little bit about this business you mentioned. Not critical. Some of my colleagues thought, what, Switzer? You're out of your mind. <laughs> no, Jack, in keeping with everything else that he did, nurtured it, put it along, and, and helped it out, and was encouraging without being too much on one side or the other, but not judgmental. And so, hey, Jack, thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Jim Rectine, and uh, I'm two years retired out of the Department of Radiology Division of Anatomy. And I thought I'd just give you a little bit of insight in my relationship with Jack Johnson, which started in 1993, actually. I started to teach uh, gross anatomy because the department I had been hired in the MSU with, which was the Department of Biomechanics, closed down. It was closed. The politics were interesting. Those of you that work in universities can, can probably imagine. So, so as time went on, I first met Jack in the lab, probably 1994, and, and it was, we were kind of uh, close because we were both old, and, um, and that was a kind of a distinguishing feature about that. Uh, but we didn't really become friends or anything like that. We were just colleagues that worked together teaching gross anatomy, and I know Jack was not a gross anatomist, and I was a metallurgist, actually, so it was kind of an odd marriage. <laughs> And, um, but, we, it, but it seemed to work pretty well. And then in 1998, the university made a decision to close the Department of Anatomy. I, I, was the, I became the acting chair of that department uh, for about 10 months. <clears throat> and it was a, uh, without getting into the reasons or the causes, uh, first of all, I guess I should point out how anatomy worked at MSU. There are two medical schools at Michigan State University, the Osteopathic College and the MD College, and they shared the anatomy course. So uh, that, that was kind of a unique feature of, of, of this institution. Secondly, there was no dissection at any time in any of the anatomy courses at MSU. Uh, there, hasn't, there wasn't then and there isn't today. Uh, we did have prosection. We had uh, uh, students taking electives to prosex specimens, and that's it was used in a prosection lab. So they had a laboratory. Um, about two thirds of the course was uh, contact hours in the laboratory, and one third was lecture support. That, um, and it had to be fairly synergistic. The if the lectures didn't dovetail with the labs, it just didn't work because of the, there wasn't enough time. There was only 168 contact hours total. So anyway, the department closed in 98 and was sh shifted to a division under the Department of Radiology. And it was a catastrophic change in the, in the dynamic of the way things worked. Um, at that time, um, we had two full professors that were teaching veterinary medicine, and they went over to the College of Veterinary Medicine. We had two young professors, one of whom is an old professor now, I see him in the back there, but two young professors who we had to find a home for. They were both on tenure stream, but they were not tenured, and it was clear that they had to get into a place where they could achieve tenure, so they went to physiology. And then there were five full professors in the department of an, then department of AMI who all left at that point. As you can imagine, when your department uh, closes, there's kind of a, somebody saying, we don't value you in some way. And so we lost five professors. And uh, at that time in the department, we had one uh, full professor that actually had a day job as a dean. And then we had one graduate student and two postdoc students, and Jack and I. And Jack and I were standing in the embers of the burning building trying to put together an anatomy course. And really, we kind of envisioned that in that September, we'd have 250 students boiling through the doors and 
we did not have an anatomy course. So radiology put up the services of the radiologists to give the lectures. And they were marvelous. Every one of them was detailed, and I learned more anatomy during that time than, and I think Jack probably did too, than we had ever known before. They were good, but it didn't, there were, it was like there were two different courses going on, the lab and the, the lecture, but they, they were unrelated. And, and the students, of course, um, don't have time to make the intercorrelation. You've got to kind of put them together. So I, I became the division director and again had tremendous support from the chair of radiology, um, and, and Jim Pochin, but Jack was my only confidant. And during that time when we were trying to do this, he just gave me tremendous support. And it was always in a very generous way. It was always, you know, I'm a person that uh, faces every problem with kind of a panic. <laughs> it's just not gonna, what's gonna happen next? We, we don't have anybody to teach. So he uh, calmed me down and was actually uh, a major supporter in a very innocuous way. Might we try this? Would it be appropriate to, to look at this? Do you think we could do this? And he somehow got me through that period of time, uh, the summer of 99, I guess it was, um, without me committing Harry Carey. And at the same time, which was, and he knew a lot about curricular issues, no question about it. He was the consummate academic that I've ever known. Um, there was so, some potentially uh, faculty issues or, or, or clientele, uh, people issues, and he was able to kind of lead me through those kind of things. And uh, I couldn't figure that out. I only found out much later uh, probably five years after all this was over, when the smoke cleared, that he had been a chair of a department and, and clearly knew how to do that. And some of you who have spoken today um, were here when he was the chair of a department. But I, I had none of that history. And, um, but he was able to always kind of lead me down the right path. And um, I've always been indebted to him beyond description for that help that he gave me, not, not for the rest of my time here, because I finally, the department, the division got up and running, radiology provided support, we eventually hired some people, um, and the course, uh, but for, the, for that one year, that eight months really, when we had to interdigitate that course with a bunch of very good radiology teachers and a bunch of postdocs and graduates the graduate students we had for that course were actually in the Department of Anthropology. So I don't know that we would, we would have gotten through it. Anatomy had uh, the resources of radiology. We would have been through it, but I don't know if the students would have gotten through it. Um, as it turned out, at the, at the end, we, we, when we reviewed the course, we found we had done everything. We were literally writing the lab objectives while we were listening to the lecture that morning and to see what we had to do in lab in order to make it fit with the lectures that were being given. And we only missed one item. I think we, we somehow neglected to teach about the urinary bladder. And uh, <laughs> I've always been wondering how the students of the class of 2003 did when they first <laughs> confronted people with a complaint of cystitis. I don't know <laughs> how they put that together. But fortunately, medical schools tend to be redundant and they, they got all in. So I, I thought I would offer that. This is the only reason I wanted to speak at all. It's just to let you know he had talents, and some of you know that now that I've seen the, the previous speakers, far beyond just working in a laboratory and far beyond just teaching neuroscience, which is really what his main field was. He went back to teaching a lot of neuroscience, but during that six month period, I don't know if we could have survived without it. And um, I've always been indebted to it, and I can understand well how his former graduate students looked at him, because that's exactly the courtesy and the professionalism and the moral support that he was able to give me during that time. So anyway, thank you. That's all I have to say. Okay, um, so my name is Keith Sudheimer. I was uh, a student and, I, and a mentee of Dr. Johnson. And I never 
really, um, I never really saw myself that despite like graduating and moving on to several times to other positions, I never saw myself as something other than a student of his. Um, so when, uh, when it came time to sort of put together something to say, uh, I found it really difficult because there's so much of what you learn from being a student of his that just gets inside of you, you know? Uh, and that's what Bob and I were talking about. And so it took a while of just like uh, going around in life and all the time I lean back on stories and lessons that he taught me that, uh, that just come up all the time in life because he didn't just teach people about neuroscience or anatomy, but he taught people about life. You know? That's all the great teachers do. Um, so I, I just wanted to share a, a few of those things today, and it goes back across uh, several points in, in, his, uh, in his career. Um, and so I, I, uh, the, the first thing is uh, um, he invested heavily in people, as you all know, right? So his, his real legacy is the, the people, some of which are in this room, and you know, it stretches uh, worldwide. Um, and so a few uh, lessons on, uh, on dealing with, with, with people that just, and this stuff comes out is if you're, if you're just around him, right? If you just like are uh, around him, he's one of these guys that would, you know, these just like nuggets of wisdom would just like pop out out of nowhere. And if you, if you have the right recognition of it, it just sticks with you, you know? So these are a couple of those things. Um, so um, the, the first thing that, that stuck with me is uh, just on, on other people, he was always a, a very open guy. And, uh, and I recall one time at a conference, we're just riding in an elevator and a couple of strangers that, that were at that conference too, we struck up a conversation with them. And, uh, and the, this, this couple in, invites us to, to dinner and I'm like, this is, this is sort of a weird thing. Like we just, we, we will talk to you for like 30 seconds, right? And, uh, and, and Dr. Johnson, without hesitation, he's like, he's like, yes, we'll see you in the lobby at, in five minutes or whatever, you know? And he's just like totally open that, uh, that way. Um, and that, that was, a, that was a, a lesson I learned. And, uh, and he, he summed it up in just a, a quick line uh, for me. He said, he said, Keith, I think you'll find that uh, if you give people a chance, you'll rarely be disappointed. That stuck with me. Um, another one was actually, I, I asked him one time about his time uh, being a chair uh, of a department. And he said the biggest lesson he learned from that, uh, that time was to, uh, to be kind to the people on your way up because you pass them again on your way down. <laughs> um, a lot of us, uh, uh, I know I had a few setbacks uh, when I was uh, working in the, in the lab with him and that's common for everybody in research, and so I asked him one time about uh, a few of the, the setbacks, the notable setbacks he had uh, in his career. And, um, well, w one was related to this, but he it was working with sloths uh, at the time, and I, I, I was, uh, okay, so I was asking him about, like, uh, bad things that happened to him during, during the process of, of research, and he, 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 he told me about this story and he pointed to his hand and he has, had this gnarly scar on his hand, right? And he's like, he's like, I got scratched by a sloth, you know? And a lot, of people, a lot of us that worked with him know that he was sort of a slow guy himself, right? He sort of moves slow, sort of talks slow. And so I sort of thought about it like, in, a, in a way to be diplomatic, I'm like, I'm like, aren't they kind of slow? And his eyes got all big, like in recognition. And, and this is what he said. He said, he's, they're fast when they want to be. <laughs> fast when they want to be. Um, uh, and then uh, another one was a, a story. Uh, uh, of, he was doing raccoon electrophysiology at the time and was training these raccoons. was telling me about a time that, uh, that he uh, was transporting the raccoons uh, across campus and just pulling them across in, in, in a container. 
And uh, the raccoons knew how to get out of their cages, right? They had the, the uh, dexterous hands, and, and he looked back when he was uh, carrying them across, and off the raccoons go <laughs> across. And he had been training these raccoons for like years, right? And, uh, and so he watched them scamper off and thought about it, right? And, uh, uh, and so he said the, the moral that he learned from this whole thing was to panic slowly. You can panic, but you panic slowly. And so, uh, so what he did is he saw him scamper off, so he left the cages there, and he went to lunch. He just went, he just went to lunch, went, had lunch, and, uh, and came back and found the raccoons back in their cages. Right? And he just locked the cages and, and took them off. His explanation was they knew where home was, and they knew where they got fed, so they just went off on an adventure, and they came back. Panic slowly. Uh, on uh, on time. So, uh, you you guys saw it on the uh, on the ad for on the e email that came out. You know we were we were doing a lot of things in the lab and we were all uh, very busy and stressed and. And he, he was taking on some new project and I said, "Do we really have time for that?" That's when he said, uh, uh, you never have time, you either take time or you make time. And then uh, that last thing that sort of stuck with me about him, and this one's hard, is um, he, whenever he would have a phone conversation, and I don't know if this is a military thing or something that, that, that he learned, but uh, he would never say goodbye on the phone. You know, whenever the phone call wrapped up, I would watch him on, on, on this side of the, of the calls and the, uh, the conversation would wrap up and he would just sort of slowly hang up the phone, never say goodbye. And uh, the thing that I took from that is that he sort of lived in a way that he always knew how he felt. He always knew, sort of, just from his actions and, and the way he was with you, how he felt about you. And so now, when it comes time to say goodbye to him, you don't have to if you carry his teachings with you. So you also don't have to say goodbye. Thank you. Not sure if anybody else uh, is feeling the spirit, but it can be powerful. <clears throat> um, I think some things that have struck me, uh, just to, to wrap things up, and again, invite um, each and every one of you to join us at uh, Dusty Cellar um, to con continue these conversations and memories. Um, it's, a deep, it's a deep well, it's a deep spring, and that will continue to bubble up, I'm sure, uh, for some time. Um, but uh, I'm just struck by one thing. Um, I certainly can't speak for Jack, but um, I can repeat what he said over and over again about Michigan State and the bigger picture and his colleagues uh, in the neuroscience program when I was here and uh, just the, the acceptance of Michigan State. And it's, it's hard to understand um, without context, but as comparative types being taught by him, uh, that can be everything. And uh, Michigan State provided a community and a... Uh, <clears throat> A network of support uh, that would take you through the ups and downs and even though that was something that you uh, in recent decades years may ascribe to an older culture bygone age where just there's low-hanging fruit everywhere and grants just grew on trees and uh, so forth but um, but but that wasn't ever the case really um, and uh, one thing I think that uh, that I got from him was uh, <laughs> So, so, so hats off to Michigan State. We're all a product in some manner and form of the bigger picture at Michigan State. And it's wonderful to see uh, the people that helped shape me uh, much more uh, directly in terms of my scholarship than Jack did, um, and, and in some ways as much in thinking. Um, but, but that's a really important thing. You, you are a product of your environment. And the, uh, the MSU ethology, if you will, um, is, is a rare one. Um, but uh, I, I recall... Uh, 
thinking about being down in Louisiana at New Orleans, <clears throat> which is a little bit more hustle and bustle than he's used to. Um, but uh, I recall that uh, we were up one morning, um, and I think maybe going for a, a breakfast or a brunch or something, where uh, staying downtown around uh, J.B. Johnston Club at the, the Bourbon Orleans, you're, you're kind of right in the middle of uh, the, the sweep, if you will. But anyway, uh, a younger man uh, came up to uh, proposition us with uh, jokes and uh, then following up with that with uh, some extortion practices <laughs> that uh, quickly led, you know, caught, raised my hackles and so forth. But I realized then that uh, the Jack was panicking slowly. And so he just calmly, you know, just said, oh, that, that, that was a good one. Because um, I'm thinking, hold on a second. But he calmly pulls out a 20 uh, and passes it over to the guy. The guy says, thank you, thank you. Okay, gentlemen, have a nice day. And I had mixed emotions, but uh, Jack just said, uh, hey, we get paid to do our hustle. Why shouldn't he? And so <laughs> he was certainly a uh, pathological optimist. Uh, <laughs> as he would say, um, but in any case, I think that gives you some sort of personal sense that you, you never know, and uh, um, to treat everybody with, uh, with respect, and uh, you'll, you'll reap the benefits. But uh, with that, I'd like to please uh, introduce Dr. Sis. Oh, you don't have to introduce yeah, me. Not I, I didn't realize you were yeah, wrapping up. Sorry. I, I, I would have volunteered oh, to. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, I just am not as... Yeah, no, I hadn't planned on, on saying anything, but um, listening to everybody's remarks, by the way, I'm Cheryl Sisk, and I've been at MSU since uh, 1985, and so when I arrived as a faculty member that year, I guess Jack would have already been here 20 years, and he was already an icon uh, to uh, neuroscience students and, and um, just other, yeah, he was already an icon uh, at, at MSU. and. Um, Personally, I uh, just um, have always appreciated the contributions that he made to the neuroscience program, teaching systems neuroscience um, for years and years and years. And uh, he served on um, some of my graduate student committees early on. But I just wanted everyone to know, especially his former students, and you've talked very poignantly about what he meant to you, but I just wanted you all to know what he has meant to um, graduate students in general in the neuroscience program at Michigan State over the years. Um, they all, I've, I've talked with and emailed with um, a bunch of them since um, I, I heard of Jack's passing and they've all emailed back talking about their remembrances and, and how much they learned from him in systems neuroscience and just um, what an influence he was on their lives. And I was talking on the phone with one of my former graduate students just this week uh, Russ Romeo, who's now an associate professor in psychology at Barnard College, and Russ got his PhD here in 2002, um, would have taken systems neuroscience with Jack probably in 97 or 98, and he was just reminiscing about that and how, what, how influential and how much he had learned from Jack. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, relate um, something that Russ said to me that I've heard so many times and have actually witnessed um, myself. Um, and this is in neuroscience seminars, so we have them weekly. And, um, and Russ was talking about, yeah, you know, we'd go into seminars every week, and Jack would sit in the front row, and about five minutes into the seminar, that guy'd be asleep. At least his head would be back, and he, you know, his eyes would be closed, and he'd sleep through the whole thing, or so we thought. And then at the end, when Q&A comes around, Jack raises his hand and throws a question bomb that it's like, he must have been paying attention. It would be just like the question that you would want to have asked and answered um, while apparently sleeping through the entire seminar. Apparently he was not, but it looked like he was. So anyway, Russ remembered that, and I just thought Jack was an amazing, amazing um, professor, and um, he'll, he'll always remember him. And, his ability to sleep through seminars and then ask the, the biting question at the end. Auditory goes last. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl.
maybe two. So I knew him on the personal level like you guys do. <laughs> Bear with me. Hold this, please. Thank you. He meant a lot to me. He spoke very highly Michigan State. Up until his last week, he was planning on coming back to teach, to do his seminars. That man was dedicated to this school. He was dedicated to everybody. He was always a friend. Never had nothing bad to say, maybe on occasion, but, <laughs> but for the most part, it was always positive words. And I, told, I would never forget, even on his dying bed, he said, enjoy life. Don't worry about time. You're not going to have a lot of it. Enjoy it while you can. And so, to me, he was a great man. And I'm glad I got the opportunity to know him. I met some of the faculty here. And I'm grateful for you guys supporting him. Even in putting him in the scooter, taking him up here. It was a struggle, but he wanted to do it. So, thank you guys.